Hello and welcome to BCF Online. We're going to be looking at John chapter 14 and verses 1 to 21. Uh, so let's read that passage together now. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, so that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the, that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counsellor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long the world will not see me any more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realise that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him, and show myself to him. Well, as we come in to look into God's word, let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you for the things that have been written down for us to show us more about you, more about how you want us to be your people and how you have made that way possible for us through the Lord Jesus. Lord, we ask that you would you would help us uh, to understand that word today as we uh, as we look at it we pray that you would open it up to us that we would see these things in a new light as you speak to us through them help us to apply them to our our own hearts and to to live by the truth that that you want us to in the help and strength that you give us we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, God's people are a pilgrim people, and the Bible is quite clear that we are not to build the foundations of our lives in this world. Instead, we are to make our earthly lives a, a journey to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. At the present time, the days that we're living in are extremely challenging and we're looking forward to the time when restrictions will be lifted. Now, God willing, despite COVID-19, we are to start a fresh chapter in the life of the fellowship here as we start meeting at the new Pasture Lane Community Centre in November. But how do the words of Jesus, I am the way, the truth and the life, in John 14 and verse 6, speak into this? What does the Lord of the church have to say to his pilgrim people as we look to the future? 
Well, this I am comes at a really important point in John's good news about Jesus. From the beginning of chapter 13 to the end of chapter 17, John records for us what Jesus taught his disciples in the upper room at the Last Supper. Much of what he said here was a preparation, preparing the disciples for what was to lie ahead, preparing them for the next few awful days. As to their horror, Jesus would be arrested, tried and put to death on a cross. But in what Jesus has to say to them, he's looking forward. Forward beyond the cross and the hardships that both he and they will have to face over the coming days and into a new future following his glorious resurrection from the dead. In other words, as Jesus is speaking to his disciples, he's directing them onto the next phase of their pilgrimage together. That is together, of course, minus one. We know that in John 13, Satan has entered into Judas Iscariot and he left the upper room to go and betray Jesus. So Judas is now no longer included in Jesus' preparation of his disciples for the future that lies ahead. He's no longer included in God's purposes for these pilgrims. What Jesus now says to his disciples is to prepare them for their pilgrim journey together towards heaven. Now, so often we can be guilty of thinking that of that journey as being a solitary pilgrimage. Now, of course, there's great truth in the fact that Jesus saves us as individuals and we do indeed go on a personal pilgrimage to heaven. But what we so often forget, because we live in a culture that has an unhealthy focus on the individual, is that our pilgrimage is to be done in community. A good example of that is in Psalms 120 to 134, which are called the Songs of Ascent. Now these psalms are sung by groups of pilgrims as they make their way up to Jerusalem to celebrate one of the festivals there. To journey together in this way was an important part of Jewish culture. Now journeying together then is what Jesus is encouraging his disciples to do. He's preparing them for pilgrimage to the new Jerusalem, to heaven itself. Now they can't go on that, to that destination yet but in John 13 Jesus is calling them to begin the journey which will see them get there and as they head towards heaven this community of pilgrims is to be clearly identified by one outstanding feature their love for one another Jesus said a new commandment I give you love one another as I have loved you so you must love one another by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. However, we go on to see that this pilgrimage, especially the one begun by those first disciples, is going to get off to a rocky start. Yes, there's no doubt that the disciples loved Jesus. But despite protesting that they would faithfully follow him to death, it's Peter, their spokesman, who's rebuked by Jesus. Will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the cock crows, you will discern me three times. But just as things seem to be getting uncomfortable, Jesus redirects the focus of his pilgrim people to where it should be, on God and on the fulfilment of his promises. Now, of course, John's account of the good news of Jesus begins with these words. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And now Jesus is opening the eyes of his disciples so that they can really see the destination that God has planned for them. Even though Jesus is going to suffer and die very soon, his immediate concern is for his disciples. He wants them to keep going in his strength so that they can finally realise eternal life at the end of their life's journey. This is what he's going to accomplish for them in his death and resurrection. The disciples need to trust, in, trust Jesus in God's strength, trust that simply not just for the dark days ahead, but for the whole of life. That trust is going to be the sure and certain hope in their lives as they look for Jesus to return and take them to be with him 
in his father's house forever. Well, as Jesus looks to the future, he declares, you know the way to the place I'm going. Well, thank God that the disciples are human. Thank God that they're exactly like us and so often they miss the point. Thank God most of all for Jesus' loving patience as he deals with his disciples. Now Thomas obviously thinks that Jesus is referring to an earthly destination and he says, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Look, Jesus, he's saying, you haven't even given us directions, never mind a map. How do you expect us to get to where you are without them? Now the answer to that question is one of the great statements that Jesus makes about himself. Before we get there, though, the, the great thing about the, the first disciples' pilgrimage, as well as our own, is that we find that we are given the best route map and set of directions ever. Not only that, but the course we are to set is very straightforward. When Aileen and I were first married, we would use a road atlas to set a course for what, wherever we wanted to travel to. And if we couldn't find our destination, Using that, we would send off for an AA route. And as early drove, I would give her the directions from the sheet and she would grow more and more infuriated as the route would factor in every single mini roundabout and minor obstruction to it just to make sure that you were on the right road. Now, thankfully, the route that Jesus is giving his disciples here is not so complicated. His message is also just as much for us in our own age because what he's teaching here is an eternal truth showing that he is everything that men and women need to be right with God and for God's promises to be fulfilled in them. So Jesus reply then to Thomas's question about knowing how to follow him is comes with these words I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Jesus is effectively saying in those words, in me you have everything you need to be made right with God and so take up his great and precious promise of salvation. Jesus is the way. As the cross looms ever closer, Jesus is pointing the disciples to his sacrifice for their and for our sin as being the way to be right with God his Father. Each one of us, you say, has rebelled and disobeyed God, and he required that our sin had to be paid for by a sacrifice that was pure and perfect in every way. And it was only in Jesus, God himself in the flesh, who God the Father accepted as meeting his qualifications to be able to fully pay the price for our sin. Jesus took the place in God's judgment hall where you or I should stand and was condemned by his Father. There on the cross, he took God's punishment in full so that we could know God's forgiveness and be granted the freedom to serve him fully. That's why Jesus is the only way to reach the Father and his promise of eternal life. It's only through trusting in him that our sin can be forgiven. Our lives turned round with a new focus on following Jesus. And we can begin a brand new relationship with God which will last forever. Now if you've never put your trust in Jesus before, then now is the moment to do so. Acknowledge that it is only through the cross that your sins can be forgiven. And with Jesus' help and strength, Follow his way to God's presence forever. Well, I trust that you truly know Jesus, the way to the Father for yourself. Jesus is also the truth. Among my books at home is the most famous title that art students have ever heard of, but have probably never read, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. It's a fascinating book about a philosopher's obsessive search to define quality and truth. And at the end of this, he comes up with the Zen Buddhist answer to define truth, which is simply to say that truth 
is. Now, in a sense, the author has realised that truth is much, much bigger than he is. And that is right. But he has missed out a vital word that makes sense of everything else. And that word is Jesus, or God. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is truth because he is the only one who can make us truly acceptable to God through his sacrifice on the cross. He is the only one who truly has the power and authority from God to save us from sin. And then Jesus is the life. If the way and the truth had their focus on the cross, then the, then the life has its focus on the empty tomb. It's because Jesus rose from the dead that all disciples have a new focus on gaining the eternal life in Jesus that God has promised them. The Apostle Paul writes this, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings becoming like him in his death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Through Christ's resurrection, power at work in our lives, we will be raised from the dead. Paul doesn't know how this will happen, but he knows that through Jesus it certainly will. But we must also take note of something important in his statement. Following Jesus way and using Jesus' truth to guide us does not make for an easy or comfortable life. A picture of this comes at the beginning of Exodus chapter 16. Here, the Israelites on their pilgrim journey from Egypt to the Promised Land have been camped at a place called Elim, which had 12, 12 springs and 70 palm trees. Now, this would have seemed an ideal place of plenty in the middle of the desert. So when they had to leave, they were reluctant to do so, and they grumbled against Moses and Aaron who were leading them. But God had promised to settle them in a land of their own. The land he had promised to Abraham. And that was something far better than an oasis. But to get there, he had to lead them through the challenge of a desert. Now it's an important reminder to us that the Christian life can often be hard. And following Christ's pilgrim way, difficult. And we are very aware that we are in the middle of a spiritual battle. But often when we most need it, God does bring us to these places of refreshment and revival and how we need them. But these places are only temporary. We shouldn't be putting roots down in them. Like Abraham, him, Abraham himself, we should be heading towards the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. These times of refreshment and revival might be foretaste, a foretaste of heaven, but they are not heaven itself. So we go on in the power that raised Jesus from the dead, trusting in the one who bought for us the precious gift of new life in his name and whose life guarantees that, that his promise of an eternity with him will be fulfilled. But why do we know salvation through Jesus? How can he be the way, the truth and the life? The, the answer is that we're not just dealing with a man here, even an extremely special man. As we've seen through the I Am series, Jesus has been declaring that he is God. And he goes on to make this clear again in verse 7. If you really knew me, you would know my father as well. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Well, although the disciples struggle to understand this, Jesus is declaring that he is one with God the Father. Now that's vital for us to understand, as it's only because he is God that Jesus can be the way, the truth, and the life. He has the power of God to accomplish these things perfectly, and to make our salvation complete. Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus lives forever, and he's actively ensuring that we reach our heavenly destination and the eternal life that he won for us 
on the cross. But there was more wonderful news for Jesus' disciples, both then and now. In verses 15 to 21 of John chapter 14, Jesus goes on to speak of how salvation is made even more secure. He reveals that he, the Son and God the Father, are actively involved in our salvation as they send us God the Holy Spirit to work in our lives as we trust in Jesus' work on the cross to make us right with God. Jesus calls him the Spirit of Truth and his work is to actively implant God's spiritual DNA into the hearts and lives of all believers. Now in human terms, DNA is what makes us who we are. It shows us that we belong to a particular family. It shows us that we have grandma's nose, Uncle Fred's ears and a sense of humour like our dad. But what spiritual DNA does is to, to make us like our elder brother, the Lord Jesus. And when other people look at us and see what we do, how we act and how we speak, they should be able to see our family likeness to Jesus himself. Anyone who has trusted in Jesus is now born from above and God is not going to abandon his own children to their fate at the hands of the evil one. The spirit of truth is given as a guide to help us walk with Jesus on his way and to bring to life the Bible, the word from the word, so that we see that it is true and learn from it, apply it to our hearts and live by it as we go on our pilgrim journey. But how do we know that the Holy Spirit is in someone's heart for certain? Jesus says, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. Our loving obedience of God reveals the Holy Spirit's presence in our hearts and lives. And it's so important that we know, we, we know this, that these verses, verses 15 to 21, are topped and tailed with this fact. Obedience to God by listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit and following his instructions as he directs us on our pilgrimage shows us that our spiritual life has its vital signs intact. The Holy Spirit doesn't just work in individuals though. As we reminded earlier, the pilgrimage we are on, we are not on alone. Each local church should be a pilgrim community, glued together by the Holy Spirit at work in its midst. This is what marks out a spirit-filled church, and the Bible explains what this should look like in practice. Be completely humble, and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. It's also why we should stir up one another to love and good works, that is, of being Jesus in the work he has for us to do, not neglecting to meet together as, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We are called to exhort and encourage one another on, step by step on our pilgrimage to heaven. That's what Jesus wants for his church as we demonstrate the reality of the risen Lord Jesus being at work in our midst. We are God's pilgrim people and Jesus, God himself, is our way, our truth and our life. There is no other route by which we are saved and there is no other one that we can be saved by. Through the Holy Spirit, he is leading his pil pilgrim people ever closer to the fulfilment of his promise of eternal life for us. May we look to him, the way, the truth and the life, as we enter the next stage of our pilgrimage, confident that he is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, as we seek to follow his will and direction for us as individuals and as a church. May we be encouraged that Jesus is all that we need for our journey of pilgrimage and fix our focus on him for the way ahead so that through his people he may be given 
all the glory. Amen. Well, if you'd like to find out more about some of the things that, uh, that you've heard about, then there will be a slide uh, coming up once I've finished speaking that will give you some information about how to do that. Thank you very much for watching.